why don't we lift our hands to him this morning. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. I believe he hears us today. I believe he sees us right now. Oh, praise the Lord for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your mercy. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Don't you love what you feel on a Sunday morning? Thank the Lord Jesus. I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 34. And we have a little reading to do today. I'm excited for our guests, saints of God that are in the house today. I uh, know that there are many places you could be, and as things get to feeling, there are many places you feel pulled to be. And there are, there is, there is no other place, amen, that you should be um, than in the house of God. See, that's a pretty bold statement. Well, He created everything you see and know in the matter of a week. And He established the Sabbath by resting at the seventh day. That pattern went forward in His people's lives and cultures built off of His statutes and precepts such that they called it the Sabbath day. It was their first day of the week. They would stop everything. Their steps were limited. What they could do was limited. Of course, we know that eventually became very um, uh, religiously restricted and became a bit of a legalistic um, repetitious activity. But the purpose for limiting steps was for limiting access to other things. So you could move around on the Sabbath day, but if you pay attention to Acts chapter 1, they had a limited amount of movement because they went on a Sabbath day's journey. In other words, the steps were related to the amount of distance they can move. Why, why would we do it? Because it always has been and always should be that on one day of the week, we relegate our focus to the one who created the whole week, to the one who gave me the job I work every week, to the one who gave me the house that I work on every week, to the one who gave me the marriage that I, I, I spit it. I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad we're focused on him. And this morning, if life is pulling at you and job is pulling at you and AC units or heaters today are pulling at you and refrigerators are going, that, that's all real life. Amen. Bump your neighbor and say, welcome to real life. We all have it, right? But here we are in the house of God. And here we are where we can access portals of things that are beyond anything. That, that Thank you, Brother Williams. My needs grow so small when I get in the presence of a holy God. So if life's pulling at you this morning, why don't we raise our hands to him right now. And let's say, God, I need you above all, beyond all, in spite of all. I need you on a Sunday morning. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Come on, you can get your heart engaged this morning by engaging your words. Come on, it's out of your mouth that the abundance of your heart is going to speak. Come on. I'm not embarrassed to relegate a day to him. I'm not so busy I can't. Come on. You're here already. You might as well love on him. You're here already. You might as well raise your hands. You're here already. You might as well thank him for another day. Praise God. Praise, praise God. Praise God. I so thoroughly enjoyed the preaching and the ministering of Brother Phillips, Evangelist Phillips, over the past week. What a great time it was and enjoyed being consecutive nights in the house of God with you. And our numbers, even in the midst of dire sickness, showed that there is a community and a church within a community that is hungry for the things of God. Can anybody say amen? 
So we are looking forward, I believe, to the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd of January. Brother Phillips will be back with us and um, on that Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night. And I believe that we are going to pick up right where we left off and that God is going to draw us deep, deep, and bring us high, high into the things that he has for us. I want to read six verses of the Word of God. It's going to seem like we cut it off kind of right in the middle, but I think we will be able to encapsulate this portion of the Scripture with verses 5 through 10 of Exodus chapter 34. The Word of the Lord says in Exodus 34 and 5, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He proclaimed the name of the Lord. In the previous chapters, Moses has asked him, show me who you are. Show me your glory. Let me see you. I, I, don't, I don't want to mince his words, and I don't want to devaluate his words, but Moses was kind of at that spot in life where it's God, whoever you are, and, and, and wherever you are and whatever is supposed to happen, you need to show up and you need, I need you to speak to me today. Show me your glory. And here was the response of God. He descends into the cloud, stands there with Moses, and he begins to proclaim his name. And the Lord passed by before him, and this is what he said. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste. This feels like our posture this morning. It's a morning to make haste. And bowed his head toward the earth and worship. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And behold, or rather, and he said, and there's five words to this. He goes on for a while about a lot of things. We'll probably read the entirety of verse 10 before it's over with, but let's just focus on five words. Moses asked, show me who you are. God descends and begins to proclaim himself. Speaks all this to Moses. Moses says, forgive us, help us. We are already your people, but what we have found ourselves in iniquity and, and we, need, we need you, we need to help you. Would you receive us as your people again? And this is what the Lord says in response to that request. Behold, I make a covenant. Behold, I make a covenant. Long, long has church become religion. Long has a 20-minute drive at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning become the scheduled rule of the day and Thus, religiosity creates a revolving door at the back of a church. You come in and you sniff and you taste and you sample that which could be and that which should be. And then we sacrifice that potential on an altar of habits and disciplines and what I'm supposed to do and what I should do and we skip this big thing. Because God is telling Moses here today, and I, I don't know how much of this I'll actually say, but 
God is telling Moses here today, if you want to become mine inheritance, in other words, if you want to stick around, if you want to become locked in and your heart um, to where it cannot be uh, permeated by the filth of the heathen worlds through which you're about to walk, in which we walk on a daily basis, six, seven days a week. If you want to really become something that's going to stay, if you want to be here when the next year, if you want your name to still be written on these on these conversations, that here's, here's the deal. It's not just about all that man thinks it's about. It's really not about your sin. It's really not about whether I will or not. No, no, no. Here, what we need to do is we need to make covenant. So if you're here today to get your name checkboxed, if you're here today because you're afraid somebody from the church is going to text you and wonder where you were, if you're here today because you couldn't come up with nothing else to do, and I doubt that there is anybody under the sound of my voice that is like that. Thus, the beginnings of my statements today, then you are going to be severely underwhelmed by what I have to preach today and by what I feel like God is going to do among us because today, he's not interested in a checkbox. He's interested in a covenant. He's not interested in you walking in this building and patty caking with you. He is interested in a covenant. I am preaching to every young person who remains with us. I am preaching to every married couple. I am preaching to every elder. If you think that the last 50 years of living for him are going to get you through the next 10 or 15, I'm telling you, he wants from you today exactly what he wanted from you as a teenager. He wants to be in a covenant relationship with you. Now, if you're interested in, in engaging in covenant with him, I want you to lift both of your hands into the air. You may not even know what that word fully means. We're going to learn a little bit today. You may not know what all that entails. You may feel like you're signing up for something without reading the fine print. And I would normally advise you not to do that. But today would be a really good day to say, you know what? I've tried it on my own. I've created my own rules. I have failed. I have bumped around. I have wasted years of my life. I'm willing to try it somebody else's way. Don't try it my way. Don't try it their way. Don't try it religion's way. Don't try it for any other reason but then that it's God's way and it's the way his word tells us to walk. Come on, would you lift your hands and open your voice? Come on, the man. Come on, the man on the television, he told you he told you there's a lots of ways to get where you're going to hey, There's a lot of ways to get to a lot of places. But we're not just going to any place. We're trying to go to heaven. And there's only one way, one truth. Oh, and it's not exclusive to me, but it is exclusive to this book. It's not exclusive to my experiences, but it is exclusively found inside of this book. And inside this book, I find a God. You can paint him how you want. You can demoralize him as you want. You can make him look however you want. But at the end of the day, he's a God that did everything he did so you could be everything you can be. He did what he did so he could have relationship with you oh praise God you can be seated on a Sunday morning I am overjoyed that you're here and I believe God is already speaking to us and y'all are going to have to turn the heaters off because I am dying this is an oversimplified statement but I believe one that can be backed up from one cover to the next. That while he does make demands, while he is concerned, and I won't take a long time, it just the, the truth is, he's concerned with how I talk. He's concerned with where I go. He's concerned with where I spend my time. He's concerned with how I dress, amen? If you don't think God cares about how you dress, you need to revisit the fall of man because Adam and Eve were covered. Look at your neighbor and say they were covered. It wasn't are you covered, it's how you're covered. 
God is concerned. <laughs> Much as any groom would be with how his bride behaves. And that is the piece of the puzzle that is difficult for 2024 to understand. Because we have such a skewed view of relationship. We have such a, a skewed view of, of, of commitment. We have such an awkward understanding of what it even means to be in a covenant with someone. Not a contract, not an agreement, but a covenant. Covenants seem to be linguistically more alive. They are more entailed. They connect me to you. Amen. They connect us in a way as we will find in so many atmospheres, angles, avenues, and layers. They connect us uh, indelibly one to another. Uh, decisions flow through the veins of covenants. I, I bring all my brand new married couples in and I tell them, you have to understand something about getting married. You can't win if they're not winning. That's a covenant. You can't, you, you can't lose without them losing. And so the best way for you to get victory is to ensure their victory. The best way for you to be happy is to ensure they're happy. You don't give 50% and keep 50%. A covenant is 100% and 100% mingled together as a whole because the vascular system of a covenant means if I'm not winning... You're not winning if we are in covenant. Oversimplified, maybe. Provable, definitely. God simply wants relationship, covenant relationship with his people. God made man on the sixth day. He made a lot before man, and everything he made was good. But whereas the mountains never cease from standing, whereas the sun, even in an eclipse, never ceases from shining, it's simply shrouded, whereas the moon never ceases from rising, he made the sun to rule by day, the moon to rule by night, the two great lights to do their job, and never are they found late, wanting, unfaithful. Because they operate by creative order. But in our creative order, God put something in us called free will. He put something in us that the scholars will call free moral agency. I am always available to swap teams. I am always available if I so choose to hire out, so to speak, to the highest bidder. Otherwise, living for him would not be worship. It's worship because I choose. It's worship because I choose to. He smiles on you on a Sunday morning because you chose to get out of bed. Choir, you could have clicked decline on PCO. Ushers, you could have never showed up. Guests, you could have stayed under the covers at 27 degrees when the sun rose this morning. But you chose to get up. Chose to get dressed. Chose to spin your gas. Chose to come to the house of God. And your decision... Listen, decisions are powerful. They're powerful beyond anything that we could even manufacture. There is no engine more powerful than a decision. There is no bloodline more powerful than a decision. There is no million dollar contract nor, nor legacy of untold wealth more powerful than a decision. One decision. One decision. Because a decision, here's why it's so important. Bishop Wilson, who's coming February 4th, you, you want to cancel everything you have. Everything you have. A decision is an incision that cuts away every other possibility. 
So you know why when you come to the house of God and you raise your hands, when you wake up in the morning and you choose to dress according to the word of God, when you, when you decide to filter your words and your attitude according to the B attitudes, when you decide to do that, you know why that's so pleasing to God? Because you have thrown the life's knife into everything and said, you know what? All I want is him. All I want is his way. There is nothing else. I make a decision that cuts away every other possibility and I'm choosing him and I'm choosing him alone. Praise God. The power of one decision. And so a God who makes man winds up two books later repenting himself. The Bible says it repented him that he had made man. How is it? Well, relationships can be tricky. <laughs> but how come all you husbands and wives are looking, are looking to the ceiling so much? What's the deal? Relationships can be tricky. Because the thing you long for and the thing you know that will complete you and the thing that, 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 that them and them only, that they are the only ones that can really give you what you are so deeply desiring. Nobody else, nothing else, no fame, no fortune, nothing. When it goes sour, when they go a-whoring after other gods, biblical word, BT does. When they decide, even though you got them out of Egypt, even though you shut the Pharaoh's mouth, even though you showed yourself powerful over his magicians, even though you raised, spent 120 years developing a man for the job, even though all of that, just a couple of miles into the desert, they're melting everything they have down, creating a calf, and they're worshiping it, and the lewdness and the debauchery that occurs while Moses is on the mountain with God is beyond what we could discuss in mixed company on a Sunday morning. And so the thing you create that has the power in it to bring your wildest dreams to pass is the thing that will make you someday say, I wish I'd have never created them. Why would God say that? Because while humanity is the only thing that can worship him, humanity is the only thing that can worry him. Well, you're quiet on a Sunday morning. Humanity is the only thing that can really worship him. But humanity is the only thing that really worries him as well. Amen? Because humanity is the only thing that worship him. Humanity is the only thing that can keep worship from coming to him. Why? It must be because his desire is relationship. Covenant relationship with you and me. It's why he created us. It's why he created the pathways for us us to get back to him after our fallen nature it's why he keeps us it's why he blesses us it's why he's good to us does not the word of God say it's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance so long before sin came long before the fall occurred Long before humanity got themselves in the fix of all fixes, redemption was not only thought of, redemption was not only contemplated, redemption was planned. Every drop of blood accounted for, 33 and a half supposed and approximate years accounted for, a lamb slain before the foundations of the world was ever laid. Can I tell you, his plan is to win, and he has never lost a battle, and he will never lose one in the future. The Bible says that he is in the ages, and he is of the ages, but he is never found outside from the ages. He will never lose. However, his plan to win not only incorporates, but it necessitates my victory. Because as a person in covenant relationship with him, he only wins if I win. 
My God, there's so much preaching ground right here, but I feel such a break to stop and to just simply talk and preach a little bit here and there. He, he counts on you winning because your victory fuels his. See, how could anything I do have such have such an impactful um, have, have have such an impact on, on, on a God so great? Well, that wasn't my design. That that wasn't that wasn't the government's design. That wasn't some committee just shortly after World War II's design. No, no, no. That was his design. He made a wolf as he made a wolf and a giraffe as he made a giraffe. But he made you and I in his own image. Male and female created he. Male and female in his own image. The difference in you and the sheepdog down the road is they don't look like him, but you do. And if he wants anybody to win, he wants you to win. What's funny is the relationship stays alive if you keep the victory. And you keep the victory if the relationship will stay alive. It's not impossible. It's not against the grain. It's actually fixed in your favor. Relationship is what brings victory. And victory is what makes the relationship so Sweet. Praise God. And realizing the depth and the and the gravity of our relationship, something else steps into the picture, and they could put my title up. Because he didn't make us in ignorance. He didn't form us out of the dust of the earth in, 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 in a maybe or a probably or some kind of a, uh, like my boys call them, construction manual. Some instruction manual that hopefully this looks like, you know, what it's supposed to look like at the end of this and we don't have any leftover parts, right? God didn't do any of this on purpose or on accident, rather. He didn't do any of this uh, uh, with, with, with some kind of general confused you know, idea. Well, no, he made us just like he made us on purpose. And he knew. He knew. He knew, he knew what Eve would do. He knew the decision Adam would make. He knew the potential for what Cain would do. He knows all things, amen? amen. And so he institutes this concept long before that, yeah, I'm going to push you out of the garden, but I'm going to push you out of the garden so that your immorality does not get frozen in immortality. You know, I kind of thought that would go over a little better. He pushed you out of the garden, Brother Lopez, so that in your sin, you wouldn't become eternal in your sin. You became immoral, Eve, when you ate of the forbidden tree. But you were not immortal in your immorality. You weren't eternal in your sin. I got to get them out of the garden unless they eat of the tree of life and are forever removed from my presence it was not judgment that got them out it was mercy that moved them out a mercy that can keep a covenant alive a mercy that can buffer me between what I must have for victory and what necessitates my victory mercy stands between me and blowing it all mercy stands between me and ruining it all mercy stands between me and sticking the stick in the proverbial spokes of salvation and crashing the whole thing if you have ever once in your life obtained mercy you ought to throw both your hands in the air and thank him Hallelujah, 
If he didn't want you to win the first time you sinned, he'd have flicked you off the face of the earth. Come on. If he didn't want you to win the first time you messed up, he'd have squashed you right where you were. Can I tell you why you're still alive? Can I tell you why the drugs didn't get you? Can I tell you why the car wreck didn't get you? Can I tell you why? Why is it out of all the families I came from that I'm still here? Because he's got enough mercy to keep me in covenant. Look at your neighbor and say, mercy is a must. Come on, look back at your neighbor and say, mercy is a must. We can't do it without mercy. We can't sing without mercy. We can't, we can't counsel without mercy. We can't do nothing without mercy. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet in his book of Lamentations, would say this in chapter 3, verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. He wasn't recalling the power of God. He wasn't recalling the creativity of God. He wasn't calling the healing of, no, 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 no. What I need to remember when I'm at the very bottom, is this it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed the only thing standing between me and being consumed eternally my God haven't you had it don't you feel it in the building this morning come on hasn't it been right for you Because God's compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Great. What just happened? We just walked into covenant language. Great is thy faithfulness. And because I'm tied by covenant to you, your faithfulness feeds my faithfulness and your mercy should feed my mercy and that's why he says forgive and it shall be forgiven when you pray pray like this forgive us our trespasses as that's a big ass As we forgive, forgive us as we forgive. Forgive us as we, why? Because I'm in covenant with him. And great is his faithfulness. And great is his compassion. And great is his mercy. But it flows to me. My faithfulness needs to start reacting to his faithfulness. My mercy needs to start reacting to his mercy. My compassions need to start reacting to his compassions. It's not mercy for me to go take another hit. It's not mercy for me to live 2024 like I want and come back in 2025 and try. No, no, no. It's mercy for a covenant. It's mercy so I can remain in. It's not mercy for first their disobedience. It's not mercy for further debauchery. It's not mercy for further no, no. It's mercy for a covenant. Yeah. A man after God's own heart. He was very sinful. Very embellished. Very given to whims and wiles of his flesh but quick to repent. And David, he had made, and I'm I'm inserting this. We don't find this exact wording in Scripture. There's your disclaimer. But he, he, he connected in arms with Jonathan. He was close to Jonathan. He made a pact with Jonathan. It was as if he had a covenant with Jonathan. Jonathan had a son. Jonathan had a son whom was about f- five years old when everything went down. And I think about five when his dad died. So even pre five years old, too small to walk fast, his nurse grabbed him and hurrying out 
into safety because the kingdom was under siege. The nurse fell. And Mephibosheth was from that point forward after the accident lame. And in one place the Bible says he was lame from a fall. And David's unaware of this lame boy who's now grown into a man. And David is realizing the mercies of God. No, 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 no. Not everything's no more. Absalom has gone, and, and what the prophet said has happened, and the baby, uh, the baby from Bathsheba Sheba has died, and all of that stuff. Yeah, life is life, and what I put into the ground grows up, but David is still yet realizing the mercies of God. And David decides, you know what? If I'm getting such great mercy, I must show such great mercy. Listen, listen what he does in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Verse number one, David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may shew him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And I might have misappropriated the bloodline there. Forgive me if I did. Is there anybody of the house of Saul? Now listen. Mephibosheth could have never known the connection between David and Saul and David because he was a boy when they died. It wasn't that David was being pressured. And mercy gets weird, doesn't it? <laughs> mercy gets sticky sometimes. Mercy gets complex sometimes. Mercy gets kind of weird. And, and we'll pray for people. God, have mercy on them. Or do we know what we're praying? Because mercy gets a little complex. Are they going to know I had mercy on them? Are they going to know I prayed for them? Are they going to realize that I, how should I act? How should I be? How should I put on? And is anybody going to see me in my, and you, when I forgive this or I forgive that, be it, be it actions or debt, I, 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 probably, I think I want to stand up and I want to say it. Because mercy gets really weird. You know, the truth is, you have to have mercy on somebody even after they've died. I've known people held a grudge, bred bitterness in their lives, waiting for a man to die. And he died. And you know what was left? An expensive casket, a bunch of bones, and a bucket of bitterness. Because that man dying, that woman dying, that preacher dying, that governor dying, that policeman dying, it don't matter. You're still going to have to find mercy in your heart to forgive. Because you still carry the wound. You still carry the wound. David, Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth don't know nothing about you. Mephibosheth don't know nothing about your pact with Jonathan, Mephibosheth, but it don't matter. Because I'm not, I wasn't just in covenant with my brother. I'm in covenant with God. I'm the king of Judah. And I have gotten his mercy. And now my mercy is fixing to react. And listen to what he says. That I may shew him kindness for Jonathan's sake. You look that word kindness up. If you have a premier study Bible in the, in the median, you see where it's actually translated covenant faithfulness. covenant faithfulness. What are you doing, David? I'm just now realizing why he ever had mercy on me. I'm just now realizing why Nathan ever came and talked to me. I'm just now realizing why God has allowed me to stay on the throne. And in covenant with a merciful God, I refuse to not keep a covenant of forgiveness with others. Somebody in the building, I, I, this is not in my notes. I did not mean to go here, but I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is tapping you on the shoulder and trying to tell Tell you, he will forgive you as you forgive others. I'm not saying to wait for asking, but when you come into covenant with him, he is going to turn you back out, not out of covenant, but he is going to convince you, he is going to convict you. Same word, he is going to move on you to go back to that relationship, go back to that wound, go back to that problem. If it is not in person, in private, in your heart and your prayers. And forgive and release. Oh, 
Old timers are say it like this, no buts about it. I forgive them, but they don't know how. I forgive them, but I forget that, forget that back half. How about this? I forgive them. And it's quiet in a Pentecostal church. I forgive them. They didn't apologize. I forgive them. They can't make it right. I forgive them. Because guess what? You can't make what you did right either. Or you can't make right what you did wrong either. That sin from last year, that sin from yesterday, that sin from early this morning, that sin you're harboring in your heart, that sin right now you're planning on going out of the walls of this church and doing it after you cry a few tears and see if you're still close enough to get where you need to go. That sin, you can't make it right. The only thing that'll cover that sin is mercy. The only thing that'll cover that sin is blood. The only thing that'll cover that sin is forgiveness. Why are you depending on them to make it right? So that you can have a healing to your wound when you can't make God's right other than to repent and trust him to forgive. Is he a God of judgment? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. But right now, the reason why people get it so jacked up I live like I want Monday through Saturday and come and repent. It's because his judgment in this dispensation is mingled with something. It's the dispensation of grace. Does he become a different God? Does he change? No. He's the same God. He's the same God that swallowed Korah up. He's the same God that gave that whole band to Emirates. He's the same God. He's the same God of judgment that he was in the Old Testament. But in grace dispensation, he mingles his judgment with mercy. He mingles it. He, he mixes. It's got mixture to it. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 10, don't put it up. The Bible begins to talk about severity of judgment, severity of wrath, severity of calamities. And all the world is on fire. And, and all the fish and people in the sea die. And the world's coming apart at the seams. And you know how the book of Revelation describes it? It's a wrath. It's the cup of his wrath and judgment without, you can find it, 14 and 10 of the book of Revelation, 14 and 10 says this, without mixture. Without mixture of what? Mercy. Because the covenant's over with the Gentile nation. The covenant's over. He sealed it. As far as the Gentile nations, it's done. If you're not a blood Jew, it's over. And now... His nature remains the same. It's just no longer mingled with mercy. Sister Tanya comes. I was reading this week, prepping for a conference in February. I was reading this week, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. Put it on the screen, please. You've got three sets of judgments. Seals, the seven seals that are open, and a corresponding judgment comes. And if you don't understand that word being used, judgment, it's, 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 not, it's not the devil doing it. It's not the government doing it. It's not. This is going to sound cliche, but I mean, I'm literally meaning what I say. They call it the rising sun. It's, it's not the Chinese doing it. It's God doing it. The judgments of the fig tree, the figs fall as judgments cast in an untimely season. They're not right. You would have never guessed it. Blown by a mighty pneuma wind spirit. God pulls the trigger on the judgments that will befall the earth. And the seals are horrible. World war, famine, pestilence, bitterness, craziness. Horrible. But the seals aren't even a drop in the bucket compared to the trumpets. Because in just one trumpet blast, a third of the people on the earth die. In one trumpet blast, a third of the green grass is, in one trumpet blast, a third of the drinking water in the world is turned into blood. And we go through, and, 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 the, and the vials, the bowls get even worse. But 
this is interesting to me. I saw this and I thought to myself, you ever just read the Word of God and say, why? Why? I'm not questioning. I'm wondering. I'm cool with it. I don't plan to be here. (laughs) John said, I watched and I heard an angel fly through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, whoa, whoa, whoa. To the inhabitants of the earth by reason, here's why, of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So we've had four trumpets, we've had four judgments, four of the seven of the second set. But the heat's fixing to get turned up. And I said, they can't escape. They're not crying. You read it yourself. They don't cry for mercy. They blaspheme the one of him sitting on the throne. Why? And then I thought about it. Almost 80 named prophets in the Old Testament. One group where the Bible references 70 prophets without name. One group where he turns to another and talks about thousands of unnamed prophets that are reserved. And beyond that, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, and in 1 Samuel, I believe, prophets that are not even named. Who they're coming from, where they're going to, it's not even just mentioned there was a prophet. And you know what the prophet's job was? By and large, they would forewarn the people of God. Before pestilence would come, man somewhere would stand up and he said oh Judah you got to listen to me your priests are defiled you've defiled the temple there's there's idols and God's he not gonna go for this you're still in covenant with him and he not gonna be happy with this behavior with someone he's taken in covenant please 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 get it right and they wouldn't I mean, you have you just pick. I mean, have you read your Bible? Just pick out of the out of the hundreds of times that Israel cycled. Whoa, judgment, death, disfiguring war, years at the tip of the sword of their enemy. Whatever. But never did it come before a warning. I'm gonna make a statement, and this is our vocabulary. It's like he can't help himself. Brother Darren, it's like he can't help himself. I'm fixing to turn the heat up on this thing. Destruction and pandemonium. You just think COVID was bad. COVID was six flags. Cornell and Michael could be pretty bad. COVID was a trip to Andy's for your favorite frozen custard compared to what's going to happen right here. The world's coming apart at the seams. I'm talking, somebody do the math. How many billion people in the world? A third of them. Dead. He's got seven angels already arranged. Four of them have already blown their trumpets. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not stretching this. I'm just telling you how Bob ain't seeing it. And he grabs another angel. Now, the old Jews say that he has an angel for every day, which means if they're right, if they're right, if they're, I said it three times, if they're right, that means this angel was designed for this day because God knew there was going to be a moment where the trumpets got dastardly. And I'm not going to do that to these people that I created in my own image without at least... Warning them first. I know you can't go nowhere. I know you can't get out of it. I know salvation is closed for you, and there's Israelites on the earth. But I want you to go and tell them, whoa, whoa, whoa. Because it's in his nature. It's the kind of God he is. To send a prophet. before judgment comes. I've seen him do it in this congregation. I've seen him walk up to families 
I've seen prophets walk up to families and make a statement to them that was so out of the ordinary. So much so that he got troubled in his own mind about it. So he came to me, the pastor, and said, look, man, I don't know what this means or what's going on, but it felt so awkward, but I had to say it. I mean, I was thrown to it. I couldn't get out of the building without doing it. And he told me what he said. And, and I got it written down. I've got it written down in a prayer journal with a date on it. And those people did what the Word of God said. And those people won. Because he'll always send a message prior to a massacre. Let's lift our hands and pray. If I have found grace in thy sight, Lord, forgive us. And this is how God responded. Look, I make a new covenant. I'm going to make a covenant with you before all the people. What I do, marvels. Go to it. Exodus 34, 10. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing. I will do with thee. Listen to him say, yeah, Moses, I'm going to tell you who I am. I'm going to tell you my name. I'm going to proclaim the whole of me, all of me. This is covenant, so I'm going to be transparent with you. All of me. This is covenant, so I'm going to be intimate with you. I'm going to know you wholly, but I'm going to let you know me completely as well. I'm going to be real with you, Moses. I am Adonai. I am the Lord. I am the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim. Merciful. And we view mercy as pansy. And we view mercy as weak. And we view mercy as someone without the strength to carry through. Let me tell you, the God of all heaven and earth, when it became time for him to show himself, the first word out of his mouth was full of mercy. And if that's not enough, Moses, if you, if somewhere in the back of your mind the math is rotating about the millions of people, then let me tell you, I've got mercy for thousands. <laughs> and that, that's a poor translation, to be honest with you. It's thousands upon thousands. There is no limit. You're going to have to wait a little bit, boy. You're never going to see it. You're never going to see it come to pass. Maybe a glimpse from the top of the mountain of transfiguration. But, 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 but you're going to have to wait a minute before you recognize there's length to my mercy. And there's width to my mercy. When you top off the ark of my covenant, the visible symbol of our covenant, when you top it off, when you put the final touches on it, I want you to build a mercy seat that's this long and a mercy seat that's this wide. But David, there are no dimensions to the depth of the mercy that I will cut my covenant off. Listen to what he's telling Moses as you stand with me on a Sunday morning. I'm going to validate your position as my people. I'm going to validate our covenant together. Before I do, I'm going to reveal myself. I'm going to give you a revelation beyond anything you've ever heard or known. I am a God of mercy. And thus, we all come to him. 
on the same level playing field. I don't care if you've got millions to your name, you have sinned. Because of Romans 3 and 23 and the infallibility of the Word of God, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care how large your estate is. I don't care how many degrees you have behind your name. I don't care who your mama and daddy was. I don't care if your last name is among the famous ones that built the Twin Cities. It matters not. You stand on the same level playing field with me. Rags to riches, prosperity to poverty. Knowledge to, it doesn't matter. Come to him as you are. And he will give you mercy. But not mercy to remain as you are. Mercy for a covenant as he desires. I said, preacher, I got it. Oh, that's the coolest thing. I live like I want. I do what I want. I drink what I want. Smoke what I want. Go where I want. Talk how I want. Let me explain. Let me explain how God works. You can come however you want to come. You can come broken. You can come a wreck. You can come a hot mess. You can come all jacked up. But if you want him, you got to come to covenant. No, if you don't want covenant, I told you 35 minutes ago, this was not going to be fun for you. But if you want covenant with him, oh, 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 I got good news for you. Because the only thing that's going to get you in covenant, and the only thing that's going to keep you in covenant, we have in abundance on a Sunday morning. Because there's mercy at this altar for a covenant keeper. There's mercy at this altar for a covenant engagement. There's mercy at this altar for someone who says, you know what? Nothing else matters. I've made a decision. I've cut away every other possibility. The only thing I care about is covenant with my God. Come on, somebody that wants him that way. Somebody that needs him that way. Somebody that has to have him that way. Somebody that can't go another day without him like that. Somebody that yearns for him in that manner. Thank you so much for joining us for service today on live stream. If you'd like to see more content from Souls Harbor, you can check our YouTube channel out. And if you'd like to know some details about the various ministries of Souls Harbor, you can see some of that on our website. We're praying for you and believing that God's moving on you and that his hand is going to work a miracle in your life.